It's Ramsey Dewey over here in Shanghai, China. Welcome to another edition of Q&A with the Coach. Today we have a question from our friend Mata Brumas, who says, Hey Ramsey, if you could coach any martial arts YouTuber, like Sensei Seth, Rokas, Shintaro Higashi, Kwon Kicker, etc., to become an MMA champion, who would it be? And how would it be like? What would the plan be like? XD, saludos. Saludos a ti también, mi amigo. So... Without a question, it would be Red Chucks. Dude, Red Chucks. Our friend Jordan Gussie over at the Red Chucks channel, that dude is a solid prospect. That's a coach's dream right there. He is strong, he is tough, he is athletic, he is fast. He's got a built-in skill set. Man, the dude has skills and, most importantly, he is coachable. Coachable. This is one of the reasons I love it when rugby players come into my gym. Jordan, as far as I'm aware, is not a rugby player, but uh, when athletes come into my gym who are used to being coached and they have all these physical attributes and they're tough, tough, strong guys. Oh, man, that's a coach's dream right there. There are a lot of tough guys out there who are not coachable and those guys suck to coach. It is really hard to work with those guys. People who think they know it all or they're stuck in their ways and they're, they're not open to training or drilling the way you, you want them to train or drill. So what would the method be? Well, I'd have to first check what is check on some strengths and weaknesses, right? So I know Jordan grapples, but he hasn't put up a lot of, uh, lot of footage of it. So I'd have, I'd have to check um, and address some... Pretty simple things, because basics win fights. If a fighter does not have answers to some really basic positions, they're going to lose. And so we'd address all those basic positions and make sure that there is always an answer. And when I say answer, please do not think answer in the academic sense, because that doesn't matter. It's an answer in your muscle memory through repeated exposure. What I call drills, a lot of people call positional sparring. And what a lot of other people call drills, I call sequences. So when I say drilling, I'm talking about... I'm talking about you come up with essentially a, a sparring game with a goal to teach you a, a very specific skill set. Right, You want to get better at fighting up against the cage. You practice fighting up against the cage with a very specific goal in mind to do a very specific thing, to execute a very specific technique while the other guy tries to fight you. We would do a lot of that. Man, it would be really fun coaching a lot of these guys. Another dude I would love to coach, Rokas, you mentioned him in your question. I would love to coach that guy. I think he has a ton of potential as a fighter. I mean, physically, a lot of people sleep on Rokas because he has a fairly mild-mannered persona on his channel. He's a really nice guy. And people tend to underestimate nice guys. He's a pretty big, imposing guy, if you don't know. I mean, you watch him on your phone and he's two inches tall, but Rokas is a pretty big, imposing, physically imposing guy. Strong, athletic and also coachable. Man, he's always looking for the answers. And that, that's, that's one of the most important things. If you gave me a guy who is, <clears throat> you know, decently talented but uncoachable and a coachable wimp, I would take the coachable wimp any day. And I have. And I've gotten some results and seen some of these coachable wimps win some fights, and they're not wimps anymore. So, there's my answer. Man, that's such an interesting question. Next. Our next question comes from Bryn, who says, How do I develop discipline? This question again. I've made a few videos on this subject. I know I should get my out there and train. I just said on one of my videos. Should I bleep that out? 
I never use language like that. But that's what he said, so I read it. I know I should just do it despite my emotional state, but depression often gets the better of me. I know that repetition and consistency is key, yet despite knowing all that I can't seem to... Uh, despite knowing all that, I can't seem to move, move forward with my discipline. Thanks for any advice. Greetings from Germany. You and your family stay safe, healthy, and happy. Thank you, my friend. How do you get disciplined? You have to want it. That's it. You have to want it. Because if you don't want it, you won't do it. And you might be thinking, well, I don't want to grind and be uncomfortable and do all of these things. You have to want the result. And you have to want it more than you want comfort and safety. I have been mulling over what motivates me to continue. As a martial artist, I got into martial arts because I got bullied in school as a kid. And that hasn't been the case for a very, very, very long time, so why do I keep doing it? There's something I want, and I've been trying to put a thumb on it, and I've expressed that in different ways to help fighters win fights to be the best I can be, blah, 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 but why? But why? And I think at the core of it, a lot of it stems down to that childish impulse to prove all the haters wrong. To put the bullies in their place once and for all to drive the nail into the coffin. And that's a very negative motivation. And that is what drives a lot of great athletes to excellence. Trying to be better than the other guy. Doesn't sound very Christian, does it? But... It's what motivates so many great athletes to discipline. The desire to rub the other guy's nose in it. What do you want? I mean, what do you really, really want? Strip away the layers. Strip away the mask and the lies and the stories we tell ourselves of how noble and awesome and nice and pure we are. And at your core, what are you training for? Why do you train in martial arts? Why, why do you keep brass knuckles on your desk as a paperweight? Is it because... Is it because you're such a nice guy? Or is there something deep and dark down there? Some issues you're trying to sort out. What do you really want? We don't want the discomfort, but we want the result that comes afterward. What is a strong enough force to push you in that direction? What is the animal you are competing against that you want to squash, that you want to kill, that you want to maim? Who is the idiot who said you couldn't? That you want to disprove Who's the kid who stuffed you into a locker as a child and stole your lunch money and punched you and pushed you on the floor and shoved you in the mud and laughed at you and spat on you? That you want to fear you. These might sound like the wrong motivations, but let's be honest, let's be frank. How many of you carry weapons? How many of you own weapons? There are a lot of weapon enthusiasts out there. Some of you carry, well, I don't know. Some of you have swords or guns or weapons and stabs and spears and stuff. I keep in this room or falling down all over the place. I'm surrounded by weapons. It's a hobby of mine. Why is it a hobby? Because martial arts is a hobby of mine. It's as well as being my job. I've turned my hobby into my job. I've turned my passion into my job. 
I've turned my demons into my job. And that's pretty awesome. But motivation, man. How do I develop discipline? You have to want the result. And very, very few things are better motivators than the negative ones that drive us into the dark, dark recesses of our souls. It's probably not what you were expecting me to say. But it's only when we go down there into the dark and look ourselves in the mirror and stop seeing through that mirror darkly and start seeing the picture clearly and start really understanding who we are and what we're all about and why we do the things that we do. Why you get out there and train. Because some dude on the internet said you should. Or because there's a deep deeper seated reason because you got some issues you need to work through man because deep down you know you crave the adversity because in spite of the fact that your animal nature that natural carnal sensual self says don't it would be easier not to just sit around be a bum eat potato chips on the couch inundate yourself with pleasure Eventually, you're going to crave something. You are right now. And you realize that that thing you crave takes discipline. You want to train. You want to be a good fighter. You want to win fights. And that takes discipline. And it's not often and always fun and pleasurable and nice. And it is often painful and uncomfortable. And... <sighs> All kinds of awful in many ways. In the best ways. But unless you want the results, unless you really, really want the results, you will never be disciplined to get them. Next. Our next question comes from Mac Emmons. I made a whole video on this, but I'm going to give you a short version. Mac says, I remember in one of your videos you talked about a bad experience you had with cutting weight before a fight. Could you do a video on how to cut weight safely? Cutting weight sucks. I think it should go. I think there should be day of weigh-ins. But that's a whole other video. How do you cut weight safely? Don't cut any more than 10% of your body weight. That is the upper limit. So, for example, if you weigh 200 pounds and you want to cut down to 185 to fight as a middleweight, that's a 15-pound weight cut. That's doable. That's fairly safe. The first thing you want to do, poop. Poop as much as possible. Poop your guts out because you can hold anywhere from a couple of pounds to nine pounds in your colon at any given time. The more you poop, the less water weight you have to cut. Cutting weight is not weight loss in the traditional sense. It's not fat loss. It's not muscle loss. It's not loss of body tissue. It is loss of water weight. When athletes are talking about cutting weight, that's what it is. So, after you poop, you sweat. And there are different ways to do it. The sauna is probably the most common and the most popular, but a prolonged stay in the sauna essentially will cook your brain and you want to do as little of that as you can. Some fighters wrap themselves up in towels, get an electric blanket, keep their head exposed or sit in a hot bath or something like that. But, you know, I haven't found anything more, I should say, faster, not more effective, I was going to say, but faster than sitting in a sauna to cut a couple of pounds. So if it's a couple of pounds, meh, just spend a few minutes in a sauna, pee, spit in a bucket, you're good to go. Don't do anything extreme, like I said, anything more than 10 pounds. Don't do that. Now, if you want to get the most out of sitting in a sauna and sit there the least, warm up before you go in. Get on an exercise bike, a treadmill, something like that. Don't wear yourself out because you're going to have to fight shortly thereafter. 
but get yourself, work up a sweat before you go into the sauna, and then the sweat will come out more profusely, faster, less sauna time is better. I hope that helps. Stay safe. Don't cut any more than 10% of your weight. Do the simple math before you do anything crazy. Next question. Our next question comes from Lennon. Lennon Kitchens, who says, in response to my video about not letting go when the other guy taps in a fight until the referee stops you, he says, what do you do in the gym when someone who persistently doesn't tap because he knows that you won't break him, asking for a friend. You strangle them, unconscious, and then you let go. And then they get the fleeting pleasure of not tapping out. You get the fleeting pleasure of having strangled someone unconscious. And nobody has to die most of the time. So again, if you're rolling with somebody in the gym who won't tap to a joint lock, Switch to a choke. Strangle the fool. Next question. Our next question comes from Mikhail, who says, When training to make a traditional martial art effective for fighting, which approach do you see as superior? Do you think it is better to train an effective martial art or combat sport for a couple of years first and then start the traditional martial arts so that you already have that knowledge of real fighting, or do you believe Icy Mike and Rokas have the better solution? that training in the traditional martial art first and then spending the rest of your life in combat sports is better. Huh. So what's the goal again to? To make a traditional martial art effective for fighting. Hmm. Did, th did those guys do a collaboration, Icy Mike and, and Rokas, and talk about this? I, I didn't see the video, so I, I'm, uh, I can't speak as of what to what they have said. I know Rokas has spent a lot of time trying to functionalize Aikido, and had various failings and and uh, partial successes with with that. But um, a problem many many traditional martial artists go through is this: they train with a bunch of wimps who don't know how to fight, but they convince themselves that they're training to fight. And then they get into a real fight and realize that they don't know how to fight. And that's not everybody, but that's a lot of people. And then they go on a martial arts journey and learn how to fight. And then they look back at some of the techniques and or the kata that they were taught in their traditional martial arts and have a few light bulb moments like, oh wait, this isn't as useless as I previously expected. I was just taught wrong. Boy, did I ever have this experience myself, man. I trained in a bunch of traditional martial arts, Taekwondo, Shotokan, Kyokushin, Capoeira, Kobudo, man, bunch of stuff before I ever did a professional combat sport. If you want to be good at combat sports, train in combat sports, but we're talking about functionalizing traditional martial arts, making traditional martial arts effective for fighting. That, that's kind of weird because how many traditional martial arts claim to be effective methodologies for for making great fighters. I don't know, man. If you go through a route such as myself or Rokas or Icy Mike and train and spend a whole bunch of years in a traditional martial art and then change your focus to, hey, let's just try to win fights now, you're going to have a, a very specific experience. On the other hand, if you are a combat sports athlete who then goes to a traditional martial arts gym, what's that experience going to be like? I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm kind of curious now. Maybe, 
Man, maybe I should just go and visit all the traditional martial arts schools that I haven't tried out yet. Just drop in, see what it's like, see what that experience is like, see if I have more light bulb moments, like, aha, aha, this thing can be applied like that. In my experience, though, it's, it's like a bunch of traditional martial artists, they've got pieces of the puzzle, and a lot of them don't even know that they're trying to put a puzzle together. And you can go and train with them and collect pieces of your own puzzle to put together, but uh, if you want to learn how to fight, train how to fight. If you want to learn traditions, that's a different thing. What is a traditional martial art? Is it an old one? Nope, it's not. It is a martial art that is taught traditionally. Many traditional martial arts, most traditional martial arts, in fact, are not that old. Most of them come from the mid-1900s. Most of them are less than 100 years old. The overwhelming majority, this surprises a lot of people because they think they're ancient traditions that go all the way back to Bodhidharma crossing over from India to China and teaching some Shaolin monks or some story like that that we've heard. But most of the traditions that are passed on in traditional martial arts schools are fairly modern contrivances. Take the uniform, the gi, the belt. This is a mid-1900s tradition from judo that was borrowed and adapted by every other martial art that uses a gi and a belt. It's a judo tradition, a fairly modern one at that. The lining up and the bowing and all the Japanese school practices, if you will. I spent a long time trying to functionalize the traditional martial arts that I practiced. I spent a long time trying to justify time that was wasted. The sunk cost fallacy, do you know what that is? You sink a bunch of time into something, you sink a bunch of resources and effort into something, so you want to pay off. So even if you have evidence showing that that thing you've invested all of this time and resources into actually sucks and isn't that good, you will still continue to pool time and resources into it, thinking, if I just throw money and time and effort at the problem, it will pay off in the long run. Like a gambling addict at a slot machine who keeps putting quarters in thinking, this time it'll pay off. No, this time it'll pay off. This time it'll hit the jackpot. And it never does. Trying to turn something into something that it's not is weird to me. Man, it's weird. Next question. Our friend Temwani Nakana has been trying to get me to talk about that Will Smith, Chris Rock slap at the Oscars situation for a very long time now. He's been pretty incessant about it. <sighs> and he wants to know my thoughts on that whole situation. So fine, I will give you some thoughts. A man slapping a man is probably the least manly thing you can do, so... It's weird, man. It's weird for a lot, of, a lot of reasons. But let me just be very frank about this. Slapping another man is probably the most effeminate aggress aggression that you can... It's the most effeminate form of aggression that you can, you can pull on a guy. Maybe you've come from a culture that says otherwise, but as far as I'm concerned, pff, men don't slap men. It's, it's just dumb, man. It's just dumb. Was it shocking to see? Yeah. Sure. People, people are still talking about this, man. So 
So Chris Rock tells a dumb joke, gets slapped, rolls with it, takes it like it's like it's a joke and stays in character and keeps joking about it. Wow. <laughs> The only way Chris Rock could have handled that situation better is if he had turned his other cheek and said, Hey, Will, you missed a spot. Come get some. That would have been awesome. <laughs> Probably not very conducive to the, the type of presentation the producer of the, of the Oscars wanted to see, but that would have been great, in my opinion. A lot of folks on the internet have been lampooning Chris Rock for the way he handled the situation, saying, oh, he had his hands down, he should have brought up his guard like this. All these self-defense instructors on the internet are talking about this, like he should have brought up his guard, I would have done, like, really? Really, if you're, if you're a presenter at the Oscars and one of the most famous actors on planet Earth walks up to you while you're telling jokes, you would have got all defensive and gone into self-defense mode. That would have just looked stupid, man. Chris Rock made it look cool. Take a slap on the face like it's nothing, shrug it off, roll with it, and tell a joke. <laughs> and a lot of these folks are saying he shouldn't have joked about her because his wife has alopecia. I have alopecia, and people tell jokes about me all the time. You know what alopecia is? That's a fancy word for baldness. And very similar numbers of men and women suffer from alopecia. But there are different types of alopecia. There's androgenic alopecia, otherwise known as male pattern baldness. Androgenic alopecia basically means male pattern baldness. Then you've got the female version. What is that called? I don't know. Female pattern baldness. There you go. Gynogenic alopecia? I don't know. Basically, it happens a little differently in men and women. Men tend to go bald in a pattern, if you will. Meaning... The hairline tends to recede, you get a big bald spot in the middle, and the hair on the sides and the back tend to stay. Whereas in women, when they have alopecia, the hair gradually thins all over everywhere. Then you have guys like my friend Andrew, who has alopecia universalis, which means he lost hair everywhere, all over his body, even his eyebrows. No hair at all. So different types of alopecia... We got some unjust, unfair, inequitable standards when it comes to telling jokes about bald people. When you, I hear jokes about my baldness every single day when I read my YouTube comments. Every day, somebody ribs me about being bald. Hey, baldy, you should feel bad about being bald. Ha 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 ha. And when it's a man, you're just expected to take it. But, oh, oh, if a woman is losing her hair and you tell a joke about it, oh, badly done, shame on you. Equality. Equality. But it is kind of funny. A lot of people learned the word alopecia over the last couple of weeks. They were previously ignorant of that word for, that fancy word for baldness. And now they're throwing it around like, she has a medical condition. <laughs> a medical condition. 40% of men by the age of 40 will experience partial hair loss due to androgenic alopecia. 40% of women... I believe, will experience partial hair loss, which isn't really that noticeable by the age of 40, because it's a gradual thinning of the hair all over the scalp once again, rather than losing it all at once in a, in a specific pattern. 
And so most people don't know about this as, as much. Women tend to be better at paying more attention to their hair and what it looks like and disguising imperfections. What else is there to say that hasn't been said about this? It, it was dumb, it was stupid. And slapping a grown man is the most effeminate thing a man can do. As far as combative, aggressive techniques are concerned, it's just dumb, don't do it, don't be that guy. Thanks for watching, now get out there and train. Thank you.